So, uh, welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. My name is David Wilkins. I'm a professor at the law school. Uh, and if you're wondering, looking at me, what do I know about India? The answer is I want to learn. Uh, but I have been working in India now for several years. Uh, I run a project uh, which is called Globalization Lawyers and Emerging Economies, or GLEE, as we like to call it, uh, based on the popular television show. And uh, the project is designed really to understand just what it says, which is how is globalization reshaping the market for legal services, with particular reference to the important new emerging powers in the world. Uh, Right now, we have over 50 researchers who are studying uh, the transformation of legal practice in countries like Brazil and China. But the place we started was India. Uh, and as I said to our panelists, it's because when I began this project in about 2010, it seemed to me that India was the, the, the least studied, most important country in the world. Uh, and it had somehow seemed to have dropped off the radar screen of certainly in law schools, and yet it was one of the most interesting places where there was a at least many natural connections between the United States, where obviously I know best, and uh, and India. And so we started in India, and uh, eventually we've had we grew to about twenty scholars just in India studying the transformation of the Indian legal profession. And in fact, uh, just Monday, we submitted a manuscript to Cambridge University Press, this is a little bit of a plug, uh, for a book called The Indian Legal Profession in the Age of Globalization, uh, which contains 19 different studies about the Indian legal profession. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to be here at this panel because at this panel, we have three of India's leading lawyers, and we have many more in the room, uh, who are really living through this transformation of the Indian legal profession in the age of globalization. And in particular, what is the relationship between the Indian legal profession and legal professions uh, around the world and the global market for legal services? Um, my job on this panel is to kind of give a few overview statements around the issues we're going to talk about, and then really to allow the three spectacular panelists who I will introduce in a moment uh, to say some words on these issues, but eventually to foster a dialogue with all of you. There are many people in this room uh, who know as much as our panelists on this subject, and for many of you who are students, this is something of great interest to you because this is a subject that's really going to affect the development of your career. So let me just say a few framing remarks first. So the GLEE project really starts from this proposition. If you look at India, or China, or Brazil, or South Africa, Nigeria, several other places around the world, the, the, the states in the Gulf, that at some point, roughly in the 1990s, in India it's 1991, uh, the countries decided to open their markets to the world, to go from a kind of a totally state-controlled, relatively closed economy to one that's more or less open to the world. And the more or less is obviously a lot about what we're going to talk about here today. Um, once you do that, that resulted in two things, which we see in India quite clearly. Uh, foreign direct investment and an increasing interest in foreign capital, foreign companies in the domestic Indian market, and privatization of many state-owned assets. Once you have that, it doesn't take long before it's clear that you need new laws to be able to govern these relationships. So you need a securities law, you need an investment law, you need trade law, you need competition law, you may need a reform of the basic corporate law. You need a number of new legal structures, both to regulate the domestic economy, but also to interface between the domestic economy and the world economy that you are more and more connected with. We clearly see that happening in India. 
it doesn't take long to realize that once you develop a new legal structure, you need new lawyers or at least lawyers with new kinds of skills. Lawyers who have the skill and the understanding of these new legal structures and can interface between the domestic legal structures and the global legal structures. That's what the Glee project is studying. It starts with the most visible manifestation of these new structures, which is the development of a kind of new and increasingly differentiated corporate sector of the bar. So, uh, the development of increasingly large and sophisticated law firms. The growth of in-house legal departments, which didn't exist almost at all in many, even the largest and most sophisticated Indian companies. Uh, once you have that developed, then there's a question of how that sector is interfacing with the rest of the Indian bar. So how is it affecting, for example, the advocates? How is it affecting legal education? How is it affecting the development of the kind of administrative apparatus, the legal apparatus inside India? And then how is it interacting with the global marketplace, which of course has to do with the number of uh, multinational firms, often based in the US or the UK, but, often, but other places as well, seeking to serve the Indian market? Um, how is it uh, affecting India's ability to operate, for example, in the institutions of global governance, like the WTO, for example? The Glee Project is really trying to understand all of these dynamics, and that's what those 19 studies are about. Uh, but at the heart of this is really uh, a conflict over how much of this it will be governed and controlled in India through Indian legal sources and how much of it will be a part of the global marketplace. And that's really what brings us to the panel today. And this issue, which is often called liberalization, uh, and we'll ask actually the panelists whether they like that as a way of understanding it, has to do specifically with whether foreign lawyers or foreign law firms are allowed to, quote, practice law in India, whatever that means, and we'll ask them what that means. But it's also, I think, a manifestation of a much larger problem or much larger set of issues, which is what ought to be the relationship between the Indian legal profession and legal professions around the world? And to what extent are those uh, affecting the opportunities of Indian lawyers, uh, both lawyers in existing practices, lawyers who are coming through the system, how is it changing legal education, how is it changing the way in which India is able to operate in the global economy. We have a terrific panel of speakers today, each of whom uh, represents an important lens through which to understand that problem. Uh, on my uh, far right is Mr. Rajiv Luthra. As many of you know, he is the founder and managing partner of Luthra & Luthra, one of the most important law firms in all of India, and really uh, an example of exactly what I'm saying about a law firm that really was kind of created in this post-liberalization period, has grown to be uh, very important in India and increasingly in other parts of the world. Mr. Luther has also been very active in uh, things like the Society of Indian Law Firms and its formation, as well as in the bar, as well as the United States India Council and many other uh, parts of this question. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Mr. Nandan Nalaviji, who is the uh, head of White and Cases India practice, which suggests that there are law firms located outside of India that are doing something in India. We'll find out what that is in a moment. Uh, he is uh, a product of Harvard, and we're very proud. He's got his LLM uh, from here and has had a very interesting career doing a number of things both related to India and otherwise, and one of the most important law firms around the world, and certainly in the US, perhaps the most 
uh, globalized of the U.S. law firms, maybe with the exception of uh, Baker and McKinsey, but certainly one that is uh, uh, really staked out a major global strategy. Uh, next to him, we have Mr. Nakul Dewan. Mr. Nakul Dewan is an independent advocate representing a very important part of uh, the Indian bar. He's a member of Maxwell Chambers in Singapore, which says that it's not just the, the uh, foreign lawyers from outside of India who are coming into India, but it's also Indian lawyers who are becoming major players uh, around the world. And it's not just in the corporate commercial sector. It's also in the sector of advocates. And therefore, he brings a very important uh, lens through which to understand this topic. Uh, and as I said, there are many other people around the audience, some of whom, if they don't speak, I will call on them, uh, who I know uh, are really knowledgeable about this set of issues. So I'd like to start with Rajiv. I, I promised him that I would pick on him first, because as many of you know, he is a very shy and retiring <laughs> If you don't get him to talk, he, you know, he might not say a word. Uh, but Rajiv, you have really uh, have a very unique lens through which to understand this problem. And uh, I'd like you to start first just by saying for the few, maybe two or three people who don't know you already, a little bit about yourself and about your firm. And then maybe if you could say a little bit about how you see this set of issues unfold. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Wilkins. Uh, I'm going to call him David from now on, because uh, if, uh, if our prime minister can call Barack, Obama and Barack, I think it was it. Um, Did you see what's written in my suit? <laughs> I need a microscope. <laughs> uh, I've been very fortunate and I've learned a lot from David over the years. Um, so therefore it means two things. One is uh, uh, a large part of my so-called success is because of David. But all my failures also because of him. <laughs> so if there's an issue you guys have with me, talk to him. Uh, on the liberalization, this has been a kind of a topic which has gone on for about 15, 18 years and at different levels. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been involved uh, in, uh, uh, you know, at the possibly the highest level under GATS. Uh, there's a committee being formed for Indo US. Uh, and Indo, uh, which is JETCO, is the one between India and UK, and I chair both committees. Uh, and I've been involved with it. So I know the whole process, what's been happening, how it's been happening. I've had meetings with the various stakeholders, the junior bar, the users of legal services, etc., etc. Of course, I wear the hat of a, a majority shareholder of a law firm. Uh, but that ha with that hat, obviously, I don't want anybody else to come in. <laughs> I'd like to keep my turf protected. Who wants competition? You know, you're free. Nobody wants that. But unfortunately or fortunately, like I said, I also have various, wear various hats. And I have to, as, as the chairperson of that committee, I have to make sure that all the stakeholders are very well balanced. So in 2006, we wrote out our report, which was made public, unfortunately, by the British, uh, in spite of the fact that we was kept, uh, it was a clear understanding that it will not be made public. It was made public. There we recommended uh, the opening up of uh, the Indian legal market, but with a few caveats and a few processes which we redrafted and said what acts should change, what laws should change, you know, what should happen. All of that clearly laid out, and the path to opening is there, 2006. We haven't heard a word since. So there we are, uh, and this whole topic has been regurgitated with Obama's visit to India, and they wanted to relook at it again. Uh, the ministry again uh, got into the act, and uh, they've been this this whole process is going back and forth. My personal view is that uh, because India is is uh, you know secretary to get, we've committed as a nation to liberalize our services. And this is one of the areas which we have to liberalize. How we do it, what conditions we do it, is up to each member country. But the principle is that we as a country have already committed to liberalization. Or shall we say reform? Liberalization now has become a bad word. So uh, legal reform sounds much better. Uh, so having said that, uh, there are various other things that we need to also consider. One is reciprocity. Now, if we open up the Indian market, 
uh, for, say, American lawyers, then we should have exactly, and it's also enshrined in our Advocates Act, by the way, we should have exactly the same uh, facility in America. Now, I wonder, in America, we have, I think, 28 states that don't allow between state practices. So I think America should globalize before they talk about uh, <laughs> globalization of legal services in the rest of the world. But that having said that, also if you look at the whole EU structure, now in UK and uh, India are discussing for the last speak, 10, 11 years now how to open up the services. But what happens when England and India sign? Does the EU get involved, not involved? How does it work? Not clear. First day of the meeting I said that, till today I've not got clarity. So that's where we are. The way I thought we could do this, and or just to, I, you want me to say something about myself, not much to say. I started my life in my father's accountancy practice, and I hope there's no accountants here, and don't quote me on it, but I found that a brain dead type of work, especially auditing, I couldn't handle it. So for about, well, but you know how it is with father and son. My father was a lovely man, unfortunately he passed away three years ago, almost to the day. Uh, he said, well, son, you do what you want to do. So I started, started a tax practice. I enjoyed that much more. So two things I want to put on the table. One is I've never had a boss. Nobody's ever, I've always been the managing partner <laughs> from day one. <laughs> so that's a flaw or a gain. So second is, I don't have that much of knowledge, therefore I'm not restricted. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my mind is fairly open in terms of, of, especially in the legal field, especially how what Prof was saying about things changing and newer skills required. I was a virgin country for that. So that worked out well, and I founded the firm in 89-90. Literally had a motorcycle with no godfather, uh, no godmother, no uh, no slight meant on people who are uh, uh, children and son-in-laws of Chief Justices of India. No slight meant on Attorney General's children. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no slight. But, uh, so it started, it, it, was, it was a, uh, uh, you know, it was clearly a glass ceiling. And in India, the, the profession is very closed. So my strategy really was to be a one-eyed man amongst blind men. So I would try and see and of, or, or, or look into the future and see where the practice of law is doing. Very exciting times. A uh, lot of um, you know, newspapers and magazines have written about what a great visionary I was. I was the only guy who set up a pure business law firm in India. Actually, if I can say bullshit. Okay, bullshit. Uh, <laughs> that's the only thing I knew. I, you know, I was not a litigator. Uh, I'd done only practice in the ITAT. I did not know anything else. This is the stuff I knew, so therefore, that's what we built. And the market opened up at the right time. And I started learning, in fact, from London's former boss, Jean Goodwillie, uh, was my co-counsel in, in two major infrastructure projects. I learned all my project finance from his boss. And he would come to Bhopal, we'd spend three months on, with rotary phones, so there was no internet, it was nothing else, and I sucked all his knowledge in those, in those uh, 90 odd days we worked together. And that's how the firm grew. Now we are close to about 300 lawyers in the firm. And, and, and no plug for the firm, not required. We're not allowed to solicit either. But I just thought I'd put that on record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, we are getting uh, next week the National Law Firm the, uh, Award as well in Hong Kong. But no plug for the firm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy to be here. I enjoy what I do. Uh, and I'd be happy. I'd rather me talking, I'd rather get questions and sort of uh, more uh, sort of inputs from you guys. So, Nanda, uh, you also has, have a very interesting uh, perspective on this, and why don't you give us a few thoughts? Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, Professor Wilkins. It's always a joy and a challenge to be on a panel with Rajiv, <laughs> uh, and it's even more difficult to follow his act right after uh, he has just delivered that performance. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm based in New York as a partner of White and Case and I leave the India practice. So first of all, let me clarify what that India practice is. Just because India appears in any of the sentences that I use doesn't mean that I practice Indian law, <laughs> to be clear. Uh, which is, goes to the credit of self, actually, who have framed this debate in a way that anytime anybody mentions India and law in the same breath, it counts as practice of Indian law to some extent. 
Um, <clears throat> what we do is uh, focus on cross-border transactions, representing a lot of international companies uh, and investors uh, investing in India, uh, representing a number of Indian companies and lenders who are doing business overseas. We represent a number of international companies in international arbitration matters. Quite often, they are not governed by Indian. Uh, the, the issues are not governed by Indian law. Sometimes they are governed by Indian law. Um, so that's the basic uh, idea about what we do with respect to India practice. Uh, a, little, a few words about myself personally. Um, I went to law school in India. Uh, graduated as a member of the first uh, graduating class of National Law School of India in 1993. Uh, got admitted to the bar in India and came and did my LLM here at uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, and I was one of the students that Professor Wilkins does not remember. <laughs> um, in uh, 1994, that's when I graduated. I'm also happy to, be, to say that I was a classmate of Vikhanna. Um, and joined White and Case in 94. And that was around the time that India had just opened up its economy. And my hope was really that I would really learn what it is to be a international corporate lawyer and then go back to India uh, at the start of the wave of hopefully what would become international deal making uh, involving India. Uh, <clears throat> I was hired for a one year job at White and Case and White and Case said we're thinking about opening a, an office in India, why don't you stay on for another year? It gives us a little bit more time to set up the uh, infrastructure, uh, we'll set up the kind of office that you want and we're, you know, they, uh, just joking, they hadn't gone that far, but they were thinking about an office. Um, they asked me to stay back for another year, and uh, ultimately they did get a permission to open up a liaison office, and it was permitted by the Reserve Bank of India. But it turned out that it was just a liaison office, and I was not interested in going and working in the liaison office. Uh, so I decided to stay on over here and continue, continue to assist in a number of matters we were working on at that point of time, and one of it was the matter that Rajiv and I and others in our firm worked together, which was a great learning experience for me, working from New York with lawyers in India and learning along with them. Um, and then White and Case and a number of other law firms got sued in India for having received the permission from Reserve Bank of India to open up an office. Um, and ultimately, uh, the court held that the Reserve Bank of India did not have the power to issue that license. Uh, that was the lawyer's collective case. And we closed our office, and we are um, happily running our cross-border India practice from outside of India. And all the issues started when people started talking about liberalization all over again. <laughs> um, so my perspective is not just from the point of view of an international law firm, which is saying we want India to open up the sector to foreign lawyers no matter what. My perspective is of somebody who has grown up in India, come from India in the US, but looking at it from the perspective of a US law firm, as well as from the perspective of an Indian lawyer. Uh, and what that means is I do see the issues with uh, regulation of the legal profession in India, uh, even more so than people who have not uh, gone to law school or do not know the Indian legal profession, at least in, in, in the US. Um, and that is that <clears throat> the Indian legal profession, the regulation of the Indian legal profession definitely needs reformation, no question about it. And it's for the sake of the Indian lawyers and the reforms are not for international lawyers. There are international law firms who do want these reforms to take place, but from our perspective, from White and Case perspective, um, we are not there saying India needs to open up. It's not our call. India needs to decide if this is good for India and the Indian legal profession and all the young lawyers that are coming out of Indian law schools. And if it's really good for India, then we're happy to go look at it and, and consider whether it makes sense for the law firm. Other law firms may have a different point of view. But first and foremost, the the only time I see that people talk about reforming Indian uh, regulation of Indian legal profession is, is more seriously is in the context of liberalization. And so I think the talk about liberalization for foreign lawyers is actually a good thing for Indian lawyers because that's probably the way this, these reforms are going to come about. So with that, I'm going to pass my book.
Thank you. Now, cool. Please. Uh, you have a very interesting perspective on this, both from being from the Advocates Bar, but also because you yourself are part of a globalized uh, change. Uh, thank you, Professor. I am the baby in the system, and I am going to spend the least amount of time introducing myself. You know, when I graduated in 2001, I was told that I, would be part, I could join a foreign law firm in 2002. 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, nothing happened. Finally, I said I had to step out, which, I, which is what I did. So I took the first left turn and I moved to Singapore. And then I got called to the Singapore Bar and I started practicing in Singapore with a law firm called Allen & Gledhill, which had a, which, whose managing partner is a great friend of Rajiv Mundras, a gentleman called Lucien Wong. And two years after I got called to the Singapore Bar and started going to court, I went to Lucien Wong and I told him, I want to restart India. And he said, Allen & Gledhill can't go there. And I said, I'm a counsel with your firm. I only appear for your firm. I haven't taken up partnership, I haven't signed the, doc the document, I can go to India and set up my own council practice again. And he said, go ahead and do it. So in 2011, I went and restarted India. And then in 2014, I took one more left turn. I left Allen and Gletchill, went and joined 20 Essex Street, which is a barrister's chamber in London, got called to the UK bar. So I've taken three left turns, which basically means when I take my fourth, I'll be back at square one. <laughs> But the long and short of my life is this. I practice in India and I go to courts in India. I go to courts in Singapore and I do arbitrations in Singapore. I can go to courts in London and I do arbitrations in London. And my perspective is very simple. If I can sit in India and be an Indian qualified lawyer and I, I can go out and practice in two different jurisdictions, why should any other Indian lawyer not be able to do it? And if I can do that, why, can, why can't I sit in India and give out an English law opinion if English law lets me do it? And why can't I give a Singapore law opinion if Singapore law lets me do it? And if I, why can't I team up with London and both of us set up a law firm and do exactly the same thing? Because we're both Indian qualified and we're foreign qualified. What stops us from doing it? Now, if nothing stops us from doing it, then where is there a bar? And the bar as Nandan pointed out, actually comes from a decision of the Bombay High Court in Lawyers Collective. And what was Lawyers Collective? Were Lawyers Collective commercial lawyers? The answer is no, they were not. They're not. It's, it, it, it's a public interest organization. It's, it's, it's a non-government organization. They don't understand commercial law. They don't understand commercial realities. And what is a law firm? And it's a question which I will put to uh, the people sitting here as well as to people on, in, um, sitting with me. Is a law firm registered in India? The answer is no. Every lawyer is regulated individually. A law firm is nothing else but a collection and a pool of lawyers. So if a law firm is nothing else but a collection and a pool of lawyers, why can't Nandan and I set up right in case India? If I'm Indian qualified and so is he, we are both regulated by the Indian bar for any Indian law work that we do. We're both regulated, I mean he's regulated by the New York bar, I'd be regulated by the English bar for any other foreign law opinion that we gave. But what would that happen? Well, what would happen is that in the process, Indian lawyers would get an opportunity of sitting in India, doing whatever they want to do, being regulated by uh, the Bar Council of India, being regulated by the New York Bar, being regulated by the English Bar Standards Board. It would be great for clients because all you'd have to do is come to India and find your one-stop shop. It'd be great for the economy. It'd be great for tax. So why is there a problem? And that's the biggest question that I have. So that's a perfect uh, place to ask, why is there a problem? And, 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 and let me just say, as it's already been said here a little bit, this is not just a problem about India. This is happening all over the world. So I, again, I'm studying in Brazil. There's a big conflict going on in Brazil right now on this issue. China, which is probably more open to foreign lawyers than most other places. There, the Shanghai Bar Association is pushing back on various issues. It started really in Japan, uh, where the first was the first of the Asian tigers to develop. There was a big conflict around whether foreign lawyers could practice law in Japan. And it happens right here. I, I'm a Massachusetts lawyer. I cannot practice law in Connecticut. So forget globalization, how about nationalization, right? And for those who are law students here, I think they're keenly aware of this problem. So we see this over and over. Um, 
the question I guess I want to ask of the, each of the panelists, but then we very quickly want to get other people involved, and I'm not going to call on just because the additional solicitor of India is here, I'm not going to ask his opinion. Uh, <laughs> just teasing him, he knows I'm going to ask his opinion. Uh, but uh, we've seen this story play out in other jurisdictions, most recently in Singapore. And actually, when we were upstairs, there was a very interesting discussion, which I'd like you guys to have a little bit here, about what you think of the Singapore model. So for those of you who are not familiar, Singapore's kind of gone through these steps. It started out uh, basically banning foreign lawyers. Then foreign lawyers could set up uh, practices, but they couldn't have their uh, actual name of their law firm. They had to have a name of the Singapore lawyers in the law firm, and they could only practice home country law, not domestic <coughs> law. Then it was allowed to have joint ventures between Singapore firms and firms uh, in uh, international firms coming in the market. And just recently, Singapore has now opened up its market altogether, and we see the same thing happening in Korea. I guess the question, Rajiv, I'll start with you, is what, what are the lessons to be learned from what's happening in Singapore for India? It's a place that has, there are lots of connections. You spend a lot, all three of you spend lots of time there. What do you think? See, I, the Singapore model, I've personally spent a lot of time in trying to understand the various models. Uh, Singapore uh, decided to uh, reform their own legal setup, uh, I think, which was about 97, 98 if I'm not wrong, around that time. And uh, Prof is absolutely right, what he laid out uh, the, 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 the steps. However, the one step uh, that where they really went wrong was where they allowed uh, a joint venture firm and a Singapore firm to exist at the same time. So typically, where there's an option, those, that is what really failed, the whole system failed because of that. And all the joint ventures, barring I think one odd, who were more gentlemen, uh, or others, you'd probably figure that out. Uh, uh, they, 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 they sort of survived, but everybody else collapsed. All of them broke because there were two firms allowed: the local firm and the joint venture firm. So typically, if, uh, in any system, so one of the lessons that we've learned, at least in India, we've advocated quite strongly that if we ever open up, it should be a single firm. Uh, it, it can be that the rights of audience to a foreign lawyer will not be permitted. Uh, that's a possibility. But they can partake in the profit of an Indian lawyer who is a partner in the firm. And to answer uh, Knuckles, uh, sort of, uh, when the two of them set up their practices and start working in India, you'll have to get around that structure. You might need a commercial lawyer for that. I'm very <laughs> <laughs> so, and then what do you think about, because we know that the Society of Indian Law Firms has now said, actually reduced its opposition. We were just talking about Lali Bachchan, and somebody we all know very well, and that he sort of said they're now open to it, but they want a phased process. And my guess is this joint venture model is going to be one of the things that's going to be proposed. And I wonder how you think about that from your point of view. Bad idea. <laughs> um, I think it's a disaster, uh, totally. You cannot force um, service providers, legal professionals, into a joint venture. Uh, Nakul wants to do a joint venture with me. We'll do it voluntarily, right. not because regulations tell us to do that. Um, and you know, in, just because Singapore did it or somebody else did it, 20 years ago or 30 years ago doesn't mean that that's the model that India has to follow. You know, India, when I was growing up in India, it used to take 20, maybe a year to get a landline. And when India went through telecom reports, uh, reforms, it skipped through the entire generation of trying to introduce landlines, and they all have mobiles. And so today, India needs to skip through all the, prop, all the phases and increments that uh, or various turns, twists and turns that other countries have gone through for reforming their legal sector and get to the bottom line quickly. And what is that bottom line? Uh, and I'll, I'll nuance that statement a little bit. Again, I think India needs to really figure out what is this going to do for the country. And they need to create opportunities for all the young lawyers coming out of Indian law schools 
close to 250,000 a year with 1.4 million lawyers in India right now. And this is simply part of creating opportunities for a lot of the young lawyers in India and outside India. Um, the phase-wise progression, I can totally see that. Again, I think <coughs> the Indian complaint that there's no level playing field for local Indian lawyers is a legitimate one. It's been there for 20 years, which is that they cannot advertise, they cannot have more than 20 partners, lots of difficulties. But hurry up and reform that quickly, please. I think that needs to happen very quickly. Um, I do think that there are other steps that India may allow in the interim, like foreign legal consultant concept, which is if India is not ready to have foreign lawyers who are trained in non-Indian law schools, who are not familiar with Indian law, to come and practice Indian law, there is no reason why India cannot allow English lawyers or Singapore lawyers or New York lawyers to come to India to provide advice on those laws, New York, English, and Singapore laws, because the Indian government, Indian public sector units, and Indian private sector clients are soliciting that advice, except that they're having to go to London, Singapore, or New York to get that advice, making it much more expensive for the legal consumers. Ultimately, if India can eventually get to allowing foreign lawyers to practice Indian law with certain qualifications if they want to get to that, but I think there is probably a quicker way to get to something of a reform slash liberalization without having to take this misstep of a joint venture in my mind. So, Nicole, the, you know that there's been a lot of one interim step has been that there should be liberalization only for commercial practice and that the advocates bar, that there should be, in a, in a way, a re reversal of the 1961 Advocates Act, which said that there was one, advoc one style of advocate for all purposes, and to divide the bar again between people who would appear, advocates who would appear in court and commercial lawyers. And I wonder what you think about that as a step. Right. Uh, Professor, let me answer two questions. The first, which you in fact posed to Rajiv Rutra, which was Singapore and joint ventures, because, and that will then lead me on to answering your second question. How did I develop a Singapore practice? I developed a Singapore practice because after I got caught to the bar, I needed work. And just because I got caught to the bar didn't mean that people sent me work. And so if you get a foreign lawyer into India and he gets caught to the Indian bar, doesn't mean that he's going to get work to go to courts. He's not. You've got to understand the Indian court system. You've got to have a level of familiarity with the procedure. You've got to have a level of familiarity with the law and with the judges. And only then do you start getting work. Now, in Singapore, what happened with me was being part of a law firm and being a counsel with a law firm. I started getting pipeline work. I started going there. I started practicing. I started building a practice, which let me leave that law firm five years later, be accepted at the bar, and now be, be a part of an English barrister's chamber and get briefed by other law firms. So coming back to what will happen in India, it's very simple. If you decide to get called to the Indian bar, you would still need to build a practice and you would still need to understand procedure because nobody would be a fool to get into court and not know what's going on. And I don't know if that answers your question. It's a, I think it's a very important point. Law is both local and global. This is one of the complexities today. Law used to be the most local of all professions in the sense that the law was local, it was a personal service face to face, and now we know it's both local and global. In fact, we call it global, right, because it's global and local. But much has been said about what this means for India. And I, I warned him I was going to put him on the spot a, a little bit. And I'm, we're not asking him to tell us an official government position, although if he would like, we'd like to know that. Uh, <laughs> but we do have the additional Solicitor General of India here. It's a great honor to have him in the audience and the panel. And just from your perspective of thinking about this from the perspective of India, right, separate and apart from what it means for Rajiv's firm or what it means for White and Case, or what it means for particular advocates. How do you see this issue playing out? And I don't know, do we have a microphone? No, that's all right. That's all right. I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, first of all, my personal capacity, not the views of the government of India. <laughs> that is duly noted. Yes. Sir. 
Uh, I think uh, opening up of uh, markets in India or the foreign firms coming in, I haven't seen that kind of opposition ever from governments in India to this as from the fraternity. And I think very often it's been a matter of perceptions in India, you know, of mistrust, of creating impressions that as if, if law firms were to come in, it would take away jobs of people, people would be insecure, there would be a huge crash in the kind of clientele get, they'll all get usurped by the foreign firms. And to a large part, I think, firms, the larger firms are to be blamed for that perception. I think it's the larger firms in India which have to a great extent fueled this distrust and perception in India. I think the average lawyer will in no way be impacted if the law firms were to come into India because his nature of practice doesn't get affected at all. At a practical level, what uh, Nakul rightly said, you've got to understand procedures, you've got to understand laws. So the bigger law firms for whom Nandan represents won't really be interested in a small dispute in any case. So that completely goes out. So what are we looking at? We are looking at the bigger commercial disputes. Now who's affected by the bigger commercial dispute? The bigger law firms. And I think all these litigations, the perceptions which have been created over a period of time, pardon my saying so, and Rajiv is going to be very angry with me for that. He, is, he, he gave me dinner last night. <laughs> I think a large part of it, large part of it is the creation of law firms in India who have opposed the entry of other bigger law firms because that brings in greater professionalism, that brings in greater competition, not just for law firms, for senior counsels, for average lawyers. And that's what we were discussing, David, that everyone cutting across will benefit if law firms were to come in. But yes, I think the law firms will also have to answer one question in India when they come in, which I think is a legitimate question asked in India about reciprocity. Mm -hmm. And that's a genuine question that why should we open up when you're not willing to open up? That is a matter which law firms cutting across need to answer in India. That's so I'm, I'm going to ask the panel if they have any reactions to that, but I also want you to be thinking of questions. I mean, the, again, we have lots of expertise, and I might call on Vic Khanna just because I know him well and we work together on the Glee project. But what, what, uh, any reactions to what the uh, additional solicitor had to say? I Other than that you're going to read I am very angry. <laughs> <laughs> But to be fair, I think uh, uh, Neeraj has very aptly put it, uh, and like I said earlier on in my uh, chat, that we'd like to definitely protect our turf. I'll be lying if I say anything different. Uh, some of us have been more vocal, some of us have been less, but that's a fact. But there's also another flip to it. See, we are officers of the court. We shouldn't be playing cute with the law. We should be following the spirit and the letter. Now, as Nandan's firm understood at that time, it was purely legal to apply for a liaison office and open up, and which they did. And I was actually part of that process along with them. But there were some other law firms who opened a liaison office in India with two floors of a whole hotel as 48 lawyers working out of that hotel. And they got so blatant that they started billing with that hotel address. <laughs> I mean, that's against the law, and and so, but and also some other best friend, good friends, under the table friends, over the table friends, <laughs> all these surrogate practices. I mean, as officer of the court, I just feel very bad that we don't follow the spirit of the law. We shouldn't at least be playing cue to ourselves. We can do that for them, uh, but <laughs> which I volunteer to do. <laughs> but see, that's where the issue is. So distrust also comes from there. It's not so much how, see there's also this view, and it was raised at one of the bar association meetings that I actually called for town halls over two and a half years. I did this personally, and I met all of them. And one of them, they said, look sir, if these English lawyers come into India, they will have only arbitration clauses LCI in London. So all our filings will go out of India. This is the, the advocates uh, uh, and, the, and the arguing counsel saying. So you know, there, there are many, there's, there's some more sides to the court. But I think what Mr. Call has said is, I would say, 80% dead accurate. I mean, he hasn't addressed the other area, so I would say 100% accurate. <laughs> so, so I get my dinner tonight. I know, <laughs> but I'm still angry. <laughs> so as, Nandan, why don't you speak, but please think of questions and put your hands up, and, and I will call it. Nandan. Two quick points. Um, reciprocity. Uh, it is a very challenging issue, no question about it. 
I think there's also a lot of misinformation about it. Um, part of me says that the fact that Nakul and I could go out of India and get admitted to the bar in our respective jurisdictions shows that it's not, sh it's not a closed door. But that needs to be fully understood and have a clear understanding on it. I'll, I'll give you just a personal story quickly. Please. In 94, when I graduated from uh, uh, Harvard Law School, I was allowed to take only 18 credits. New York bar exam required a minimum of 24 credits. But there was a clause that said, if, there is subs if you went to a country and studied in a law school with a substantively equivalent legal education, you don't need 24 credits. But for some reason, they didn't think at that point of time, because I was the first graduating, well, the first graduating batch from National Law School, that it was substantively equivalent. Two, two days before the bar exam, I got a notification saying, you cannot take the bar exam. And I went to the litigator who was sitting next to me and asked him what I could do. He immediately called the court clerk in Albany, got the rule, actually, uh, got them to look at the rule, and they concluded, after uh, looking at my courses and the professors I had studied under, that it was substantive, substantively equivalent education and waived the 24 credit requirement. I took the bar exam, fortunately passed it, and, and uh, it got admitted to the bar. Foreign legal consultants, 32, so the, the regulation of lawyers in the U.S. is state by state. 32 states in the, U, in the U.S. have adopted the ABA's model rules for foreign legal consultants, with few minor variations. And a number of Indian lawyers have set up and have been admitted as foreign legal consultants to provide uh, Indian law advice with offices in various states. The major states, New York, Illinois, California, Washington, D.C., they allow foreign legal consultants. That's the reciprocity point. The last point I would make is about talk, the lawyers in India have been so focused on foreign lawyers not coming into the country. The accountants have gone right under the radar and have have done more than any other law firm could do. Uh, and we complain about the fact that lawyers who have gone to law school outside of India do not understand Indian law. There are accountants who have not gone to any law school. They stand up before tax tribunals. They stand up before regulated tribunals. These are not transactional activity. I have nothing against accounting firms. And I would actually welcome uh, opening up of the competition, personally speaking. I don't know about this is not quite in case speaking. but. Um, is then look at the kind of the silliness of this whole situation is we are opposed to foreign lawyers coming and doing transactional work and there are accountants standing up and arguing, arguing before quasi-judicial tribunals. And where is the logic to that? So the accountants are no longer, they have been accounting firms for years actually. They, first they were multidisciplinary firms, now they call themselves globally integrated business solution providers. <laughs> guess what's part of a globally integrated we business solution? <laughs> yeah, your job. Please, right here. I'm Sagar P. Thunda. I'm an IPS officer and worked in Delhi for 17 years. I have been interacting with so many lawyers and uh, ordinary litigants. There is a lot of opposition from the legal fraternity. And in the discourse, there are law firms, Indian law firms, and international law firms, and government, and the lawyers, and the bars. I want to know if we open the market in principle, what would happen to the ordinary citizens or litigants of India? What is there for them? And why they are not part of the discourse? And why there is not broader discourse in India on this issue? Is it a purely elitist agenda propagated by Harvard University or say the National <laughs> Bank? <laughs> people, there are millions of millions of litigants. If you open this market, then they would also be either facing some consequences. So what is there for them? Thoughts? Yeah. Michael? Again, I mean, I'll have to put this into two spheres. And the first sphere is, what happens to an ordinary litigant? And according to me, nothing. And that's, there's an entire misconception about the entry of foreign law firms. The issue is very simple. If you allow an Indian qualified lawyer to practice in India, and you allow him to do not just Indian law, but say New York law, and you allow him to do it under the auspices of, say, White and Case, who does it benefit at the end of the day? It benefits Indian lawyers. 
So what is going to happen if you allow foreign law firms to set up in India is that it will benefit Indian lawyers in the longer term. Let's take a steel plant in Sirohi. I mean, how, do you, how many people will understand how Sirohi works, what happens, how do you acquire land? You need an Indian lawyer for that. So, in the law, in, so, so, so the way I look at it is, it benefits Indian lawyers if you allow liberalization. How does it benefit Indian citizens? But I, according to me, it doesn't affect Indian citizens in the larger term, because the Indian citizen is not concerned with the foreign investment which is coming in and how a transaction is structured. He doesn't care about it. Does it make a difference when he goes to court? Well, the Indian advocate will always be there. So you will always be able, able to approach an Indian advocate. So why do you not make them part of your discourse? Well, if I mean, this is it's, it's not an elitist agenda. I think it's an agenda which runs across the bar. It's an agenda which today the bar needs to understand. It's an agenda which junior, junior counsel like me are very Amazing. passionate about because we've grown up uh, in the liberalized India. Uh, but if I open this up to Indian citizens, well, it doesn't really affect them. So, yeah, go ahead. And then we've got a few questions. So, so one quick point, and, and you make a very valid point. So one of the things that uh, one should see, and we can ask uh, Professor Wilkins to give us his uh, thought of how the cost, because your idea was what happens to the individuals, the local people in India, the citizen, the common citizen. Let's look at what happened in England when they liberalized. The costs of legal services went up 10 times. What's happening in Australia right now? What happened in America? I mean, yeah, I'd let you answer that, and that's that will be the uh, answer to your question, uh, that how the costs uh, go up to a different level. Because, see, if I'm a, if I'm a, pra if I'm a uh, London sitting in New York, and I have a partner in India, I charge, I'm just giving a number at the top of my head, $1,100 an hour. My partner in India gets $150 an hour and he shares the same pool with me. How will it work? So those are the kind of issues. So they'll up those rates and that's what happened in other jurisdictions. But I, I'll, I'll defer to David to explain that. I don't know the entire details of it, but I know it did go up. So, so I, I'll just say this and then I want other people to, to talk. That the question you're raising, I think, related to what we're talking about, is what's the relationship between this debate and a much broader debate about how legal services are going to be delivered in India. And that broader debate has to do not so much with this, but frankly, what are the rules about who can practice law within India? Uh, you know, do you allow, quote, non-lawyers to practice law, you know, legal consultants? There's a whole range of things, which is also wrapped up in the regulation debate that's going on in the UK. But please, so uh, here, yeah, in the back row, first, yeah. So uh, my question is for the panel generally. Uh, my name is Aditya Nag, and I went to law school <coughs> in India. And I, we've been speaking here about lawyers in India as almost sort of a homogeneous mass, and say, you know, the Indian legal fraternity opposes it or sports it or But my experience in law, when I went to law school in India was that there is a certain hierarchy or a pecking order of law schools, if you will, and there are about 20 to 25 elite-ish law schools in India. And then there are the, all the, like the state universities, whether it's Delhi University, Rajasthan University, many states. And there's a very vast distinction between graduates of an NLS or a, a national university from Calcutta and UGS, and then lawyers from these, uh, you know, then you can call them smaller, but they're really large. So what does the panel think of, like, what is their feeling on these issues? I mean, not someone from an NLS or an NLU or an ALSAR, but someone from you know, University of Patna, who is now practicing law in the Bihar High Court. So is there a real distinction then? What do you feel about that? I didn't quite get your question. Uh, uh, so my question is, basically... I've got the idea, because so the question uh, is, London, for example, belongs to the college. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's called. So Still where is your... Where is the, so I guess the question is, do you, do you see a lot of opposition coming from lawyers who are uh, trained from law schools that do not fall under those 20 odd? Or do you see the opposition coming from lawyers who are actually, like you said, a gentleman there said about the law firms? Uh, you, you, is it coming okay, from? I've, coming got from? You, I've got your question. See, uh, the opposition is not really coming from any of the big law schools or any of the law schools per mm -hmm. se, whether it's the college or the other ones. Uh, but uh, the opposition is coming, at least what I've seen, and I think is misdirected, is coming from the litigation bar. Yeah. That's where it's in, and it's and they say things like we don't want East India Company back. 
There is no real logic. There is no logic to it. Uh, but, you know, how will it help? And, and Huda Sahib must tell you, I attended a town hall in uh, Chennai. Over there, this uh, gentleman stood up and said, okay, you want to write. There was the Law Society of England and our whole committee was there. And he says, how will it help the rickshaw wala on the street? <laughs> so I told him, I said, if it doesn't help, it's not going to affect him either. What is the problem? He said, no, no, do something that will help the rickshaw wala. Only then I'll allow you to open. So stuff like that. So if the opposition is really all over the place. And I think uh, Mr. Colway rightly put it, uh, the work is not going to go down. Uh, the work actually for Indian law is going to go up if you're going to expand the market. Costs will be an issue. And the other point will be uh, that how these uh, so-called practice areas will start expanding. For example, and one of the, I'm a great proponent for that, every rooftop that our prime minister, this one and the previous one found, they've said we need to build infrastructure. You know, somebody says one trillion, somebody says two trillion, somebody says three trillion. Now, all of this can be done only by project finance. How many project finance lawyers are there in India? Total, maybe 200. I wouldn't hire 120 of them, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> and that's it. How are you going to, you're, you're, you're impeding the, the, the whole building of India, the infrastructure, the dream, I don't know what all we talk about. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so that's where the issue is. That's a big, big issue. We need, and it's not, I'm, 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 I'm not sort of, uh, because we, are, we, are, we do a lot of project finance work ourselves, and so does Mike case. And I learned, I told you from his, uh, 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 partner. The issue we need, as for na as a nation, we need uh, more lawyering in India uh, for this, particular in this space: banking, finance, capital markets, international markets. We need to raise the capital, and if we don't do that, we have a problem. So, so here's what I'd like to do because. Uh, you see Pilot is standing up here. What I'd like to do is, there are a number of people who have questions. What I'd like to do is get people to ask their questions mm. succinctly, please. I'm gonna, I've seen about four or five people. I'm going to call on you, state your questions, and then we're going to give the panel as a whole an opportunity not to respond to everything, but to pick some piece of it here. So I'm going to go first here in the red tie, then right there, here. Uh, yes, right here. There was one other person I saw. Yes, right there. Okay, and here. So if you could just state your questions kind of quickly in that order, and then we'll give the opportunity of, to the panel to respond. Please. Go ahead. So what I hear from this panel is that Mr. Nilavigi and Mr. Divan are basically uh, talking for liberalization vis-a-vis -vis Indian qual uh, foreign qualified Indian lawyers, and they should be allowed to open up su a similar practice in India, which can service. Uh, people around the globe and the pushback that I see from Mr. Luthra is basically vis-a-vis -vis, uh, not allowing foreign po foreign lawyers coming into India and practicing from India. So I, I, I see these two things as, as separate. One is about foreign qualified foreign lawyers or maybe foreign or uh, Indian qualified foreign lawyers coming into India and the other is that about Indian uh, foreign qualified Indian lawyers. So. Uh, if you could just balance that bit. Yes, please. Um, I have a rather a comment than a question. Uh, I think this whole thing is uh, uh, involves about uh, who makes money. <laughs> uh, whether Indian lawyers make money or the foreign lawyers come and make money from us. Uh, I remember a long time ago when uh, Cuban lawyers came to America in Miami, they didn't allow them to practice. And uh, this whole thing, even before the liberalization started with Rajiv Gandhi, it, it, uh, uh, there was a case here, Union Carbide case, that we were not in the law school. Uh, uh, American lawyers asking Indians, the lawyers going to law schools here, bring you a client there, so we'll give you the job. That's how mm -hmm. it started. And this uh, few law students go to LLM at Harvard or Yale or Columbia, get into some of these white and case big law firms. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are so many Indian law students going mm -hmm. all over the country, they don't get any offers. They only get to practice immigration law. Mm -hmm. uh, because we are this, so you do. So there are a lot of other things here. It's not that, uh, uh, and I see this in acting too, all these William Morris and ICM, they're opening offices in Mumbai. So there is a, 
and especially India being uh, coming out of colonialism, I understand why he said East India Company. Uh, there is still that fear, yes. and it is a legitimate fear, like sharing the economic resources. So here, my yes. question is uh, somewhat related to what you just said. Uh, if we see the history of profession of lawyer, uh, we always consider them in history. We learn about them that it's a res it comes some some kind of respect for that. Uh, Second oldest profession. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, but somehow, uh, I see these days where uh, they come up with this saying that says, intelligent people don't go to the court. So if you don't go to court, it surely means you don't go to the lawyer at the same time, most of, most of the time. So do you think somewhere that respect image or, or the profession, respect for that profession is decreasing because of a number of reasons? So, two more quick questions, and we have quick responses from the uh, panelists. Yes, please. Okay, I, I have a slightly different angle on this. Uh, my question is that uh, I, mean, I understand that both the corporate and the bureaucratic sector are well served by their legal advisors and professionals, and at the same time, I mentioned that each attorney is an officer of the law. To what extent do the attorneys or the legal profession need to take the responsibility for all the hanky panky that's been going on in India and some other countries, for example, but particularly in India, talking about the various, you know. So well, I'm sorry, we only have one more question and then we have to give the panelists a response. All right, uh, my question is hopefully straightforward. I think um, several panelists and also questioners have suggested that. Um, liberalization would be good for Indian lawyers, good for the Indian economy. Oh, sorry. Um, good for the economy, um, would grow the legal sector in India. I'm curious if any of you would be willing to put a number on that. Is, is the Indian government leaving money on the table by not liberalizing the legal sector? If so, how much? Okay. okay. If each of you, I'm going to start with you, Rajiv. You can pick any of that very interesting set of things you want to uh, give a quick response to. Uh, the second uh, oldest. I mean, so go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. See, there's a fatal flaw that's going on in my view, and I have a, uh, uh, I don't think an absolutely unique view, but quite a unique view. The world over, especially in America, law is no more a profession, it's become a business. Mm -hmm. And we talks about making money, etc. So the whole nobility that the law was supposed to be a noble profession is gone out of the window. Second problem, which I have a bigger issue with, is that once you try to hold this whole structure of eat what you kill, which most law firms overseas have because it's a business, everything is bottom line based, how many hours you build, uh, you know, how, many, uh, how much recovery you made, etc. Once you go there, you stop sharing knowledge. And I'm going to a law firm with a thousand lawyers not wanting the knowledge of four people. So that's a bit of an issue with me. What was your question, sir, uh, about well, Hanky Panky? My question was... So, there's another way of looking at it. One is, we are a profession, and I strongly believe that, but we also guns for hire. Right. Which really means that everybody has a right to be defended. Now, as a lawyer, if I think you're a murderer, not you, but if I think you're a murderer, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've got my bulletproof bottle. <laughs> if, if, if we know that you're a murderer, if I'm convinced, should, there's a huge debate. Should I accept your case or should I let you be and you know, find your own uh, ways of doing things? Getting responsibility, taking responsibility by a lawyer, what's happening, I think the whole profession needs to do that. We need to reform ourselves and need to have proper regulations. And I don't mind saying in this audience, I don't like to run India down, but we have one of the worst regulated professions, I think, in the world. Our bar council, if you look at the statistics, are abysmal. So that, that's where the issue is. So, Nandad, quickly, and then Nako. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, in my mind, all of, a lot of the questions are interrelated. Um, and, you know, starting with the point about what is the benefit to the economy, <coughs> and there was a comment about elite law schools and other law schools, respect, and making money and non other law schools who don't go to uh, Harvard or Yale do immigration law. 
I think to me it all ties together uh, in the sense that, first of all, you, you can't look at it just from the perspective of law schools or lawyers, and I do think you need to look at it from the broader society. And I am the first one to concede that bringing in more lawyers into India, especially foreign lawyers, is not India's top priority in my mind. Yeah. There are a lot of other things that need to be solved with respect to India, starting with infrastructure and other things. And thanks, Raju, for saying that international lawyers could help with that cause as well. But at the end of the day, I do think it does benefit the economy. I don't have a number to put on it. Um, it helps with the employment opportunities. Raju talked about the rickshawala not making a difference to rickshawala, but if the rickshawala's son or daughter wants to go to law school, I do believe that shaking up the Indian legal profession will make a difference because when I started uh, in the profession, those are the days when you couldn't get, expect to get paid for the work that you did. You went and worked for a senior lawyer. You carried their bags to the court, carried their clothes to the dry cleaner, and hopefully you learned something in the process you didn't get paid in the last 20 years. When the international law firms started coming in and leaving, they didn't stay there. A lot of things have changed in the last 20 years for the better, to a large extent. The standards of the profession have definitely gone up. It doesn't mean that the foreign lawyers are going to come there to teach anybody, but by sharing, they will go up. With the improvement in the legal profession in general, I do think that the legal system will improve and it will ultimately benefit all of the, um, the indigents and all the population at the end of the day. India is 1.3 or 1.4 million people for 1.2 billion, uh, 1.3 million lawyers for 1.2 billion population. U.S. has 1 million lawyers for about 300 million people. And our courts are not running fast enough in India. We don't have enough judges. We don't have enough qualified people to teach in law schools. I just think all of that is going to change for the benefit of the broader economy, ultimately. So now, I, I just have two very small comments to make. The first is know-how. I mean, I've, I've stepped out, I practice outside of India, and one of the best things that I have gained by practicing outside is know-how. Because when you share, when you learn, you just grow as a lawyer. And the second, and I think the more important thing, is accountability. Whether you like it or not, unfortunately, Indian counsel, Indian lawyers are not accountable. I mean, we, we had this little discussion before we came down, uh, to which, in fact, Neeraj Kaur was uh, there. You brief an Indian senior counsel today, and he doesn't land up in court, and literally you're standing at your wits end not knowing what to do. If you professionalize the system, you bring in a level of accountability, it will change the system. It will make it improve it will be for the better. I, as a lawyer, am insured in Singapore. I'm insured in England, but I'm not insured in India. Because I know that nobody's going to sue me in India. But if I was professionally negligent either in Singapore or in England, I could be sued. That makes, it, that makes me more responsible and more careful before I roll out any uh, advice either in England or in Singapore. But if I take a brief in India and I don't land up, I just say, I'm so sorry I couldn't land up, I got stuck somewhere else. Now that has to change. And that, if that changes, it's just so much better for the profession. So whatever changes happen, I know that we are all so much better for having the opportunity to listen to these three distinguished visitors. You have some question now. Uh, uh, which Should question? I quickly take that? See, there is no bar for a foreign qualified and an Indian qualified lawyer to practice in India. There's no bar. Yes. So I think that was the confusion I just wanted to say. And on that note, I think uh, lunch awaits. So please have a